So this all seems really backwards. I've never had an opening act quite like that. I've never had a standing ovation before I talk. So where to go from there? Um, my name is Andrew Keyes. I work at Marshall Space Flight Center. I'm really, really, really glad to be here today because I was like the last person to confirm with the, uh, with the speaker's organization uh, organizer here today. I called him, or so sent an email actually last night about 1030 saying, yes, the government looks like they're going to allow me to, to work today. <laughs> We're not going into shutdown. I am going to be able to be there. Uh, so I am here today, glad to be here, glad to be able to talk to you guys. I want to um, talk to you today about space exploration. Uh, when I was six years old, in 1972, that was the last time that man walked on the moon. Apollo 17 went, landed. Uh, walked on the moon, did some mission work, and came back safely to Earth. That's the last time humans ventured to the lunar surface. I remember as a 16-year-old watching Walter Cronkite on television, and uh, you know, being six years old, you don't really understand all of what goes on in the space program, but I remember him saying that the Apollo 17 mission is safely on the lunar surface, the, uh, the astronauts are uh, preparing to, uh, to exit the lunar uh, exploration module and do their mission on the lunar surface. So we will rejoin you again live in eight hours when the astronauts move out onto the surface of the moon. And I thought, eight hours? What could they be doing in there for eight hours? So I was a very impatient six-year-old. I wanted to see that happen. But it did inspire me to become, I said, I want to be a part of the space program. I want to be uh, a part of that and make that happen. So I find myself employed by NASA. And NASA's actually in kind of an interesting position. We only have two space shuttle launches left. Uh, we're working on what the next architecture the, uh, the agency should be pursuing. Um, there's, of course, all the government crisis. We are a government agency after all, and we are funded by Congress. So there's all of that to deal with. And it would be very easy to say, why do we even need a space exploration program? Why not to explore space? Let's just, you know, let's look at these reasons. Space is hard. <laughs> Space is hard. People had, you know, there have been failures. You saw earlier uh, where, the, uh, where we, we had Tim Pickens up here talking about rockets, how lots of people are trying to do it yourself kind of thing. And that's great. We encourage that. But it's a very difficult thing to do. It does take a lot of money and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, commitment. Space is expensive. It takes a lot of money. Space has been done. I've heard any number of people say, why did NASA want to go back to the moon? We've been there before. We've done that. Why go again? Space will always be there and can wait until later. <laughs> and space is dangerous, risky, and can be done with robotic missions. Seriously, we have lost astronauts in the space exploration missions that we've launched. Uh, the Apollo 1 astronauts died in a fire on the launch pad. Columbia astronauts died in that accident, Challenger. So it is dangerous, risky. And there have been people to argue, we have robotic probes on Mars. Why can't we just continue to do that and eliminate the manned spaceflight program? What I'd like to do, is, though, is, is at least address some issues why I think we should explore space. There we go. Um, one of the reasons is that it's emotional. It's idealistic. It's adventurous. I just said, when I was a kid, I wanted to be involved in the space program. I wanted to be an astronaut. I mean, who didn't start off wanting to be an astronaut? You know, that's, that's something that we all have kind of thought of. Why? You want to be an astronaut to run experiments and tests? No, you want to be an astronaut because it's cool. You want to get out there and walk on the moon and fly in space. Uh, this is Tracy Caldwell uh, Dyson uh, sitting in the cupola on the International Space Station, looking down reflectively on the planet Earth. And that's a really neat picture. Now, these guys do a lot of work up there, so it's not all just glamour. But, um, but uh, you know, that is one reason we want to get out there. It's the human spirit of exploring space. Now, I have a colleague who has said, um, when we talk to the general public, what sort of reasons do the public, does the public think we ought to be exploring space? Is it so we can go back to the moon or go back to Mars or send people to Mars for the first time? And he said, you know what I found? I found the public doesn't really resonate with that so much. What they want to see, the public wants to see They want to see us make Star Trek real. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I hope some of you are old enough to remember that. That was another thing I loved as a kid, was seeing the beginning of Star Trek, seeing the Enterprise. And I chose the old, you know, classic Enterprise. <laughs> old school, right? 
not the movie version or the uh, the J.J. Abrams version, but um, make Star Trek real. We're we're quite a distance from that. Uh, one of the reasons. <laughs> but everyone, hold up your cell phone. Okay. This is technology that may not have happened if we didn't have a space exploration program. I have heard that at least one third of all the cell phone cameras have technology that was developed under uh, NASA missions to, uh, to develop the cameras that go onto deep space probes. So we're quite a ways from making Star Trek real. But uh, you know, people have argued that maybe we will outlive this planet one day and we should move out and colonize space. And to do that, we've got to get better at space travel. Another reason is the military advantage and international cooperation. Uh, I've got a couple of examples up here. This makes some people uncomfortable. No one wants to see lasers in space and such. But if you think back to the Eisenhower administration when we were putting Apollo together, the space program here in the United States was a response to the Russian launch of Sputnik and some of their, uh, their probes. So we were matching what they were doing and put together a space race for the lunar surface. So the Apollo program can be considered to be a military uh, a military program, even though it was, it was run by NASA, which is a civilian space agency that's been chartered for the peaceful purposes of exploring space, uh, it could be argued that we did this for a military advantage. I put international cooperation up there because it's not just all posturing for position. The International Space Station in the upper right is a collaboration of multiple countries around the world. So uh, in the Apollo-Soyuz mission that was done back in the uh, mid-70s is another example of international collaboration. There's also international competition. One of the partners that we don't have on the space station is China. China is running their own space program. You've heard of astronauts, you've heard of cosmonauts. These guys are taikonauts. And even though we encourage uh, cooperation across international boundaries, uh, we are concerned that China is moving forward and we are still trying to get our act together and making sure that our space agency is doing something constructive when it comes to space exploration. Another reason to explore space is economic and industrial return. People are good at making a buck when a buck is there to be made. Uh, so I put a couple of examples of as we mature our ability to, to explore space and to move into space, we want to do what, the, what government agencies have historically done in the past. We want to invest in something that is difficult for commercial industry to invest in today. The example that is given is take, for instance, the railroad industry. When we were laying tracks across the country, the government subsidized initially the, uh, the development and building of that. And then companies stepped in to try to see how they can make a profit off of it. We're doing much the same thing when it comes to space exploration. NASA is forging the way forward in space exploration and we are encouraging companies to come along behind us and put together opportunities that may be a profitable model for them. Uh, uh, Suborbital hops from from the continental United States to, let's say, Japan in about two hours. Space tourism, uh, mining of resources on the lunar surface, power that is beamed from space back to Earth. I love this chart because this is one of the more important reasons I think we should continue space exploration. Information, discovery, education, technological return. I almost called this chart uh, half the fun is getting there. Getting, oh, getting, there is, getting there is half the fun, that's what it is. Getting there is half the fun. So you can set a destination, and getting to the destination is great, but what you learn along the way is extraordinarily important. Uh, it's a little bit like running a marathon. You decide you're gonna run a marathon, you're gonna run a marathon. Running the race is great, but the benefits that you realize really come in all of that training that you did to get there. If we were to, to decide to go back to the lunar surface, Going to the lunar surface, that would be wonderful, that'd be great, but the benefits that we would receive is all of the technology that we developed in getting there. Let me real briefly explain what some of these are. I chose each one of these particularly because all of these technologies have a connection to the Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, which is in Huntsville, Alabama. We are one of 10 NASA centers, and I could have easily chosen six more technologies from any of the other nine centers that NASA has across the country. But I chose these because of my local uh, involvement in them. The first one up here in the upper right is called the NanoSail D project. It's a satellite that was flown for the purpose of demonstrating how it can unfurl a very thin material that may one day be used for propulsion in deep, in deep space. That's about the size of the Twitter screen that we have over here. So to give you a sense of scale, that's still orbiting the Earth and was uh, launched into orbit about last December. 
The one in the middle is a new manufacturing technique called friction stir welding. It's a process of taking big aluminum plates and joining them together so that they have the strength of a single piece of material. The uh, picture up here of the mirrors and the guys in the, uh, the bunny suits up there, that's the James Webb Space Telescope space mirrors. Those are mirrors that are going to go on an infrared space telescope that's supposed to follow Hubble as Hubble continues to uh, do its mission well. But we know that Hubble is aging, and we also know, as I mentioned earlier, there are only two more shuttle flights. So we won't be going back to Hubble to resurface it. It will eventually fail, and we want to have a telescope up there to replace it. That's what the James Webb Space Telescope is going to do. The uh, lander that you see in the lower left is a cold gas lander that we developed at Marshall for purposes of landing instruments on the lunar surface. Uh, the Ares 1X is the launch vehicle that we developed in the process of working on the Constellation program. Constellation program has been canceled, but we did launch that one test mission to, uh, to test how the, the first stage was going to perform. And this other satellite down here in the lower right is called the FastSat satellite. It's a satellite bus, not a school bus, but a bus that you plug other things into. The electronics guys out there know what I'm talking about. It hosted several different payloads from several different companies and other government agencies for the purposes of, of running this thing into orbit and allowing each payload to act independently, but at the same time, the bus provided power, communications, guidance, navigation control, uh, that sort of thing. So we're learning a lot along the way. Another benefit, though, is NASA spinoff technologies. Everyone talks about, oh, NASA invented Tang. Well, no, NASA didn't invent Tang. We licensed Tang. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of unfortunate, all the vending machines at NASA, Tang, just, just Tang. Um, <laughs> But um, I had the pleasure of going on CNN about two weeks ago to discuss the quantum device's HEALS technology. That is a light, an LED diode, a little light, the red light, that was developed to grow plants on a space lab mission about 15 years ago. The developer took that technology and started to use it for medical applications. They're currently running medical trials now to demonstrate how this light assists cancer patients who have undergone radiation or chemotherapy treatment in dealing with mucositis, which is a side effect of the treatment that they get, the mucous membranes of their body starts to deteriorate. Some of the fast-growing cells deteriorate. And this device is helping them with pain mitigation and, to a certain extent, in the healing process. The Gulf oil spill by uh, the, the uh, MODIS satellite, and I see the font didn't quite come through there, but we have instruments that are looking back down on Earth for Earth science reasons, but are using, we're using those as a double uh, purpose in imaging areas that we need to see some detail on. So when the Gulf oil spill happened, and you kind of see that swirly thing in the middle of the Gulf, that's the oil spill, NASA was able to give data back to uh, people who are wanting to know what's happening and where the spill is going. The Speedo LZR racer uh, has been developed and tested at Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. So we have worked with industry in developing materials that are tested at NASA and turned back into uh, fast swimsuits that we're able to win gold medals with at the Olympics. And then the multifunction agile remote control robot, or the MarkBot, is a small remote control car almost, but we added some communication technologies on top of it. And now the military is using this technology in, the, uh, in, in our war zones to go out in front of a warfighter and look for IED devices before the soldiers get into that area. So we're benefiting uh, the military with NASA technology that we have uh, developed domestically. So one of my other favorite reasons for exploring space is the shame of not leaving low Earth orbit since 1972. <laughs> Back to six years old, I'm thinking, man, when, when, when 2000, the year 2000 gets here, I'm going to be an old guy. I'm going to be, you know, what is that, 34 or so? Um, <laughs> And we'll have hover cars, and we'll have jetpacks. The jetpack song, right? I was excited to hear that earlier. Um, and Tim has developed this jet. I need to borrow his daughter so she can bring out and fly the jetpacks around. But some of that hasn't happened. And a lot of that has been just the, the business of working with NASA as a government agency and determining what the right destination is going to be. So I'm encouraging you, this is your agency, you are the taxpayer, this is a federal agency that is funded out of your taxpayer dollars, to get behind what NASA is doing and let's go explore space. So let me go back to those reasons we looked at earlier. Space is hard, but what did John Kennedy say before we launched the Apollo program? He said, we choose to go to the moon and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
Space is expensive. True, but you know, when I was at school, I never thought I was going to turn into a government wonk. I went and studied engineering, but I spent all night watching CNN and the computer and such looking for details on the budget. Space may be expensive, but out of the 2012 budget that was released in, on February 14th, the President's request for what the government should look like in 2012, the U.S. federal budget is $3.7 trillion. That's T trillion. NASA's budget is one half of 1% of that. We do everything that we're going to do in the agency annually on one half of 1% of the entire federal budget. In fact, I've heard it said before that out of all the telescopes and shuttles and Apollo missions and, uh, and Mars rovers and satellites that NASA has ever launched, all of those things total up to a expenditure of seven-tenths of the federal budget ha that has been spent since 1958. So I think NASA's a pretty good bargain, and I think the benefits that we get out of space exploration justify that expense. Space has been done. Sure, we've been to the moon, but remember what I said. It's not necessarily about the destination, it's the getting there. China doesn't seem to be bothered by this. Right now, there are US, China, India, and Japan all have orbiting lunar probes. China plans to land a manned mission on the lunar surface around 2025. They don't care that it's been done before. <laughs> Space will always be there and can wait until later. True, our economy has had some difficult times recently. Uh, we've had Congress fighting over getting a budget. But one of my favorite speakers, one of the best advocates that NASA has is Neil deGrasse Tyson who's the uh, Hayden Planetarium director in New York. But he has said that science and technology are the greatest engines of economic growth the world has ever seen. If we set a destination, we start working on technologies that are gonna get us there, education, technology, spin-offs, all the things that I have been describing to you this far would benefit from that. Space is dangerous, risky, and could be done with robotic missions. That's true, but think back to that picture of the astronaut looking out the window. I've heard it said that there was actually a serious consideration when putting together the Apollo missions to send a poet with them instead of just test pilots because they didn't want to rely on the test pilots to give an appropriate account of the beauty of the lunar surface. Now, that didn't actually go through, but, uh, but I believe that space can be shared with human and robotic missions. Exploration is really the essence of the human spirit. Frank Borman, who's an astronaut from the Apollo era. And of course, James Kirk said to boldly go where no man has gone before. And I'm gonna leave you with this photo, this not photo, it's a painting, by Pat Rawlings. He's an artist that does a lot of different uh, images for NASA. And I uh, want you to contemplate that as I exit the stage. It's time to explore beyond low Earth orbit. Thanks a bunch.